Recording in progress. Welcome, everybody out there. Good to have you back here virtually. I can just feel all of you here. And you know what else I can feel is fear. Fear is in the air, isn't it? This time of year, it's fall. We're getting into we're getting into the Halloween time of year. We're talking about a horror film. One of my guests even has a jack o' lantern uh, sitting behind her in in uh, her video presentation. There, I just noticed that. <laughs> so here we are, feeling the spirit of Halloween. Not the store, but the actual spirit of Halloween as it comes to the fear. But you know what? Go to the store, too, if you need costumes. My, uh, not a sponsor, not a sponsor of the show, but I'm just, you know, I just thought I'd buzz market spirit of Halloween at the beginning. Hey, if they want to throw in, if they want a sponsor, we're <laughs> available. That's true. That You guys wouldn't turn them down either, right? We can all, no. we can make this work. Let's get a, yeah. let's get a, a purchase code for, <laughs> for Carter Inc. Films <laughs> and the Broken Brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm so privileged to be joined today by uh, Jessica Morgan and Christopher Carter of Carter Inc. Films. They are both the co-directors, co-writers, and uh, for Jessica, you also are the the star of yeah. the film uh, Night. Of Oops, the I'm harvest. sorry. I just said You're good. <laughs> Night of the Harvest. <laughs> I just I just minimized my screen. I you know what? There's another. There was another film on IMDb that had a similar name, and I wanted to make a hundred percent sure I said oh, no. it right. So I yeah. just went ahead and messed it up. Night of the Harvest, which is coming uh, to digital platforms uh, September 24th, and mm-hmm. also you guys have had some uh, some buzz. at some uh, you won an award for this show. Where is that? What did you win? I want to say it's the independent filmmakers, um, Hollywood independent filmmakers. Hollywood yeah. Independent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we actually won silver for that uh, last year. So that was that they screened it on the Paramount lot, which was a big deal. Uh, managers, agents, reps, um, and it was kind of it was a big deal for us at the time. So it's it, and, and now for that matter, yeah, it was it was cool. It yeah. was exciting. Best narrative silver for best narrative horror feature. I just found it. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Well, good for you guys. Um, Thank you. Uh, I this is. Uh, this is a feature length uh, horror film that people can find uh, the, 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 that's going to be out there. And mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, why don't uh, you go ahead and I'll let you tell people um, and you can tell them whatever you want about who you guys are and, and, and what you do. And then a little bit about, I'll let you do the synopsis of this film. <laughs> oh, <They're> awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I'm Jessica and that's Chris. Um, as you've heard us now, So we are both, yeah, we co-directed this film. It's a horror film, takes place in Halloween. Um, And it's about um, a girl named Madison who is attacked a year before on Halloween and to the point of nearly being killed. And she is now a bit traumatized. Coming back a year later, her sister wants her to kind of get back into the Halloween spirit. And her and her friends go to a party only to find out that they're getting stalked and all that past trauma is kind of coming back to haunt them. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the basis of it. Uh, definitely got slashery vibes and, um, Chris mostly wrote this. I did help with the story and then, yeah, I'm acting in it as well. Yeah. And, uh, I, well, I get, we can both co-directed. Um, I think a big part of it too is kind of what, what it's a little different in terms of most Halloween offerings in terms of like the horror films, just because we really wanted to root it in what Halloween was before it became so commercialized. And so, uh, the festival of Sawin, um, there's there's the lore that kind of comes out of that and when people hear halloween they think costumes and you know parties and it but it didn't start that way and we kind of wanted to take it back and really work the horror of what halloween was and its roots into this story and then um you know, we wanted to layer in their family dynamic and trauma and things like that. So yeah, the relationships are, I think are really important in this film too. Um, we, we really wanted to explore, you know, sister bonds and like having a friend that's so close. They're like a brother kind of a thing. So we wanted to explore a lot of those dynamics in there as well. Um, and we feel like that plays a major role in the film. So, uh, you know, at some point we'll start digging into it, I'm sure. And we have to throw a spoiler <laughs> flag up for those people, but um, that's right. Yeah. There, there are a couple, and that's actually one of the things that I thought set up apart uh your film are a couple of the the twists that are in here um i thought i think it's it's always a really cool thing when people and you can tell when they're good at it so i wouldn't be saying this if i didn't think you guys were good at it but um there there is such a thing as skillful playing around with the tropes in a genre tropes i think people use the word tropes like it's bad but it's actually 
the tropes are usually what we love about a genre, if we love any kind of genre films, right? But the, so you have to work with them in a way that's still interesting. And it's like, when do we use them? When do we break them? When do we go lean into them? When do we stay away from them? I, and I guess that's my starting question is I'm curious how do you guys with something as well trod path as horror is, how do you come to that? And what's the relationship you have with some of the expectations and tropes people find in horror? Oh gosh, I love that. Um, that yeah. you, yeah, that's that's how you feel because we feel like that too. We're very much horror fans, and so you do love the tropes, and sometimes you hate them too. Like <laughs> it goes back and forth. So I think this film, especially for us, we we did talk a lot about tropes and how we were like, is this character a little bit too much? And at that, yeah, should we just lean into that? Should we just embrace it at some point? You know what I mean? Um, I think we we have those moments in this, this film. Um, Chris, did you have those thoughts like when you were writing it at least? Yeah, yeah actually quite a bit. And, and you talk about, and, and so as the writer, you take that back from the beginning, you know, you're making a horror movie that's based around Halloween. And so immediately, as soon as you say those things, expect, expectations come into people's brains, whether it's they wanted to or not. So a big deal was how did we, how do we want to be different? We didn't want to have a traditional guy running around with, you know, wearing a mask in the shadows. Although we drew from that, it wasn't where we wanted to kind of land. We wanted to maybe start there and kind of branch off from it. And so the, obviously the characters, I think uh, Jessica mentioned it before were a big deal. We wanted people to really care about the characters and they weren't just fodder to kill, which in most horror movies, they are. We wanted people to be upset when these characters died. Um, you wanted to be invested in them. And, you know, we have a switch during the movie that we'll talk about where you really care for one set of characters, but then halfway through that, you, you there's kind of a flip that happens. And so I think that was really, really prevalent in us. And when we're writing it, because like you mentioned, how do we be different? How do we set ourselves just a little bit differently from all the other fare that comes with a horror movie and, and especially a horror movie that's based around Halloween. I mean, come October 1st, you can, you know, you throw a rock and you hit 10 of them. So how, how, how are we different? And we really wanted to kind of lean into you caring about the characters. And I think here, uh, when we write, we'll sit and we'll talk about, well, what makes this different? Big part of it too, is we want to, we want to make drama pieces with horror elements. That's a big kind of like, I don't want to say standard, but maybe like if there's, you know, our commitment to that, we want to tell a story that's got drama that has horrific elements in it. So you can classify yourself as a horror film, but we really want you to care about the characters and not fall into the tropes. You know, of course, we're going to have some blood. It is a horror movie. We want to scare you. It is a horror movie. But I think, you know, we want to toe that line in some cases, like when people hear an, about an A24 film and the company that puts out films like, you know, Hereditary and The Witch, there's a lot of dramatic cinematic pieces in that as opposed to some of the more slasher fare. You know, we wanted to, we wanted to kind of um, be in the A24 camp when it comes to that. But it's like at the same time, still like paying kind of homage to like those those traditional classic ones, you know. Um, I do think like one of our early on kills is uh, we kind of really leaned into very like Halloweenish vibes, like the movie Halloween and things. Like there was, you know, there was some playing around with being like, yeah, this is kind of very traditional slasher. But as the film evolves, we were we knew we would kind of move away from that at times. There would be like a tonal shift. Um, so we still got to, you know, fulfill our little our little heart's desires of being like, let's but we can still lean into that at times. <laughs> that's, that's the part I think, yeah, as a viewer or a consumer of it, right? Look and you say, Oh, okay, because when you're watching something like this. You know, and I just kind of going somewhat cold, just kind of watch the screener and I'm like, OK, and oh, OK, here we go. This is a this is that kind of a slasher f format and this happened and that happened. And and there's a little part of you that's kind of like, OK, is this just someone's pass at a slasher story or what are we going to what, what's going on? There's already something a little different. And then all of a sudden there is like, a, oh, wait, oh, OK, this is an idea that someone brought to this. But you had to have it be this in order to have that surprise. I said that mm -hmm. in a confusing yeah. way. Uh, you both were nodding. Maybe no, it just, sense. we got it. Just to be yeah, honest, I, I definitely we got it. <laughs> but, <laughs> it. I I felt like um, yeah that 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 created something very interesting to build with. Um, Thank you. You. So the thing that and the, this is I think representative of how trauma oftentimes shows up in real life. We start out, you know, that there is this expectation of trauma. You mentioned that Madison has had a traumatic event 
the year before, and her mm-hmm. sister's like, come on, come out of your shell. And you played her sister, Audrey, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Jessica. And it's interesting because that, again, is also something, it makes it more interesting right away, but it's also something that, you know, you've seen where it's like, oh, a close call. I bet it's related to what's going to happen this year. And boy, yeah. was it, but not in the way maybe you expected <laughs> it to but be. But not, yeah. It's like, exactly, oh, we want to twist that. Yeah, you had trauma in a slasher universe. It means probably you encountered a slasher and then you're going to encounter them again and, you know. Um, and whatever, and you start thinking in that way. And then we find out that actually, it's not that she's not traumatized, but she's traumatized in a different way about a completely different direction than you think. And so, and I wonder if you guys maybe would talk a little about the role that trauma plays for these characters, the, in this, the story. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hugely. Um, I was going to say, yeah, it, for Madison especially, she's just so driven by by that. You know what I mean? She, I think she's in a situation she feels very forced on her. Um, some of the lore that's behind this is, you know, um, and this is where we get a little difficult with spoilers, so I apologize, should we, audience. Should we put the spoiler flag up now so that it's kind of fully go into <laughs> you know? it? Yeah. I mean, maybe that's good. Just to let everyone know, you may want to check this out. Um before you know, you come back and 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 here we're gonna. I think yeah. In order to really tell the story, we probably yeah. give ourselves a little bit of permission to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a couple of, of 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 twists that we're gonna talk about. Yeah, I feel like I mean, yeah. You want to see the film? Honestly, we, if you love Halloween, you love uh, twists and movies. If you love drama and relationships and um, exploring all that ritualistic stuff comes into play in this i mean i feel like there's something everybody can get out of this movie so go check it out and then come back (laughs) um but yeah so okay madison she's you know she has this whole this she tells this whole story about what her family has been picking chosen excuse me um to fulfill this sort of ritual that has to happen every year and i think there's a lot of you know unfairness about that she's really upset about that and she hasn't accepted it well maybe her sister audrey has fully accepted and embraced it you know um so i think there's already stuff there and then of course when she's fighting that and going into this and then has has to go against what she wants to do ends up getting hurt in the meantime like kind of a betrayal even there where she's like i might have loved this guy and then this happens to me um (laughs) You know, it's it, we do. We flip it there. I think the audience hopefully is anticipating that the trauma is just from being attacked by the scarecrow creature. And instead, it's no, actually, it's just the fact that she was attacked. It's just not by who you expected by. You know what I mean? And it was in self-defense. You can't really blame the dude. Um, <laughs> you know, um, right. but yeah, we, we really want to. It was just really it was such a. You know, trauma is never fun. Um, but I think at some point in most people's lives, there's a, a moment where you're going to get hit by trauma, unfortunately. And so it was something that we were both interested in exploring and exploring what that does in relationships and then to yourself. I mean, I, li- I kind of really like the idea of that we're a year later and it's like even just being around the time that something happens does something to you. Mm-hmm. Like that's something that at least for me personally happens where it's just I cannot even be thinking about a traumatic event, but all of a sudden I'm in some weird place and I'm like, what is that? Why do I feel so like weird? And and it's like then I remember, oh, we're right around that date. Like this date, this thing happened to me and I'm so associated with that. I don't even think about it and it's bothering me, you know? Um, so we played with a lot of different trauma moments in that. And Chris, I don't know if you want to speak more to that. Well, and not just that too, but I think having to, having them be siblings, um, Mm -hmm. I'm the oldest of one, Jessica's the oldest of two. So in addition to having trauma happen to your younger sibling as an older sibling, it's kind of innate to protect your, your, your younger brothers or sisters. Like it's just from birth, it's always been instilled on you. And I think that might be something that that never goes away. I don't think it ever should, but the fact that, that she wasn't able to protect her younger sister, I think in addition to what her younger sister goes through, they're like, they're dealing with trauma on two separate levels. The guilt of, I wasn't there to help my sister. I wasn't there to protect her, even though there really is no, no one could ever imagine that would ever happen, right? But the fact that it did happen and you weren't there, it's the waves of of emotion that 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 must be going through both characters. I think we really wanted to kind of play with and and 
and find some type of like, hey, my older sister just wants to get my younger sister just back to normal. Never mind Halloween, just back to normal where she can just sit and enjoy. And how the younger sister just kind of has to deal with nearly uh, being playing with the emotions of love, but at the same time being fixated to this uh, or, 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 or tethered to this ancient curse that she has to fulfill. Otherwise, it's her family that dies. Like the levels of guilt that come along with that. Um, we really wanted to play with, and I just can't give enough credit to, to Brittany and to Jessica uh, who played those characters because really without that, I think we didn't have an anchor to our story. Obviously we're in spoiler realm now too. So um, I don't want, I don't want to come to trauma part, but like, you know, we really care for them. We want the audience to really identify and, and care for them in this, in, mm-hmm. you know, up until the point they don't. Well, and that's actually, that leads into a big question that, that I want to ask. Um, but let me, I mean, I'm going to say, okay, so here, here's the first, and this one's about a, I don't know if it's quite an hour into the movie, but we're, we're at least a third into the movie when we find the first big twist, I think. Um, so I'm mm-hmm. going to say what that is now, everybody, last warning. Um, <laughs> because the, this is, I have a lot, I have several questions that kind of come from this. So what we find out is we go back again to the flashback, right? Where Madison's in the, the, uh, corn cornfield field mm-hmm. and always scary, by the way, cornfields Love always cornfield. terrifying, yeah. right? Yeah. They Love work they, pretty much any movie that wants to just put a cornfield in there. Just they're, do they're a cornfield. Come on. Um, yeah. And, but so going back to that and we find out that of course the, the ax wielding maniac with the mask and everything is her sister, Audrey, that she, mm-hmm. Excuse me. <clears throat> that Madison brought her boyfriend here in order to do this. That this is, uh, as you put it, a a, a family tradition, right? That mm-hmm. they uh, have to do in order to quell some kind of darkness. They mm-hmm. they talk about this, um, yep. and so they've been doing the killings. And one of the things that hit me right away, there's a, there's a movie that it reminded me, in a way, um, and uh, the movie Frailty. If you're familiar, I don't know mm. if you guys have seen that. No, one, I, it's it's not quite it's not the same thing really, but it was an element of it that reminded me. It's a movie with Bill Paxton. He plays a guy. He's got these two kids. It's told all in flashback, and he has this vision uh, of uh, an angel that tells him that he's got to find these people out there who aren't really people; they're really demons, and kill them. So he tells his two boys. He's like a single dad. He's like, we got to dig this. You know, little dungeon underneath our our shed, and we got to go find these people. And you're going to help me to lure them down this alley so that I can get them and kill them and everything. And mm-hmm. um, and it kind of it, it goes through this whole thing. Basically, it's told through flashback, and uh, this is also spoiler for frailty, I guess, for everybody out there. But, <laughs> um, it starts out with a flashback, and so he's got these two sons, and one of them is younger and really into it, and then is like, "Yeah, Dad's it's God wants us to." The other kid's a little older and is like, "This is." this is not good what this dad is crazy. Right. And, and it's all staged so that you think the guy telling the story as an adult is Matthew McConaughey. And you think he's the brother who was all freaked out, you know, and was like, my dad's crazy as and then, and then the end, there's a twist that he's like, no, he was the brother who was into it. And he's actually Mm -hmm. there to kill somebody and whatever in the end. Um, sorry, I spoiled that for you guys too. But anyway, um, no, I'm going to go watch it. That's and there's great. an implication. There's also an implication that actually the dad, maybe the dad wasn't crazy and that actually God did call him to do this. At the, mm. But here's the thing. That's at the end, which makes it, oh, okay, it took us a long whole movie to get to this end. And I'm the kind of person when I watch something like that, I'm like, I'd like to see what happens next, actually. So I really respect nowadays, I see this trend where people who are clever are cleverly bringing up, hey, here's something that a lot of movies 20 years ago would end on, was this twist that you guys decided to throw in there and then keep telling the story after that twist. And I Mm -hmm. really appreciate that as a viewer um, because I think it's much more interesting. Does that make sense? Like having a big twist in a... I don't know if it's the, yeah. would you call that the first act or midway through yeah. basically, and then continuing and with the story. It's funny. That was actually something that came to, um, during a web series we were making called Omega, uh, during the pandemic. And we were, it, we were, we tried our hand at a web series. And just like you said, in most episodic television, they ended with the cliffhanger, but you know, we're, we're, we're huge fans of the Hannibal TV series. Mm. And, um, what they would do is they'd put it in the middle. So you'd kind of figure out, you, you you wouldn't have to wait till next week to figure it out. And we wanted to do that with this because really the story is about the sisters and the lore. That is what it's, that, that's what it's about. And so for us, it was like, how do we get that in there? And then 
we've built the relationships with these characters. So again, it being a horror movie, we just want to see it through. And, and, uh, uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's something that we definitely, definitely planned on. Um, yeah. I yeah. mean, we had worked the script for a while and we had talks about like, okay, do we actually like flip it around, maybe not see what happens with this group and come back? And we actually talked about it a lot where we were like, is, you know, is this the right choice kind of a thing? Um, but yeah, it, it, to us, it, it just stood out like it made the story, you know what I mean? It made it worth us going through making this film if we kept it where it was. It makes it different than just a slasher movie. To me, anyway, mm-hmm. that was what I was like, oh, okay, there's something extra interesting. And we still get to see what happens to them because sort of living and inhabiting the space with these two people that are like, yeah, our family tradition and, and our inheritance, our heritage is Halloween murder. Um, yeah. that's interesting. <laughs> and uh, what, I'm curious for uh, Jessica, for your, uh, perspective too, what was it like getting in that headspace, uh, as, mm. as an actor? Yeah. I mean, I, I you have to, <laughs> um, you, I, I had to think of it as not killing, you know, but what else is really exciting that you shouldn't be doing kind of an idea, you know what I mean? Like where, you know, cause sometimes it is exciting to break the rules and it is exciting to, and especially like the power dynamic, right? Like there's something and being a woman, especially and being like, I know I'm in full power here, um, and surprising you and, you know, you may have thought this of me, but it's this, you know? Um, all of that was really exciting to me. And so if I leaned into that, well, then, you know, trying to not, <laughs> I'm just going to have to be like, and we're replacing that with killing. So, okay. <laughs> you have no super method in your research. That's good. No. It's like, you didn't cast Jared Leto in this movie. But I know. <laughs> I, 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 there was a line that you say somewhere, I think, near the end when you're talking about it with uh, the, I don't remember his name, the one, the last guy standing. Um, but William, yeah. yeah, he says like, oh, about his friend, he loved you. And mm-hmm. you had this line that I thought, well, it was a great line because it made me chuckle at the same time a little bit too, because you're like, they all fall in love with me and mm-hmm. it makes it easy to kill them. Right. But the part of it that hit me was like, you know, I know a lot of, there's a lot of women out there who feel that way and would say that with an amount of annoyance. Yeah. yeah. That's how guys, you know, yeah, guys are kind of obnoxious that way. But then your character gets to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Like <laughs> that's kind of the thing. It's almost like, yeah, it's too easy, honestly, you know. Um <laughs> Yeah, Not a I love that line, but it just I mean, no. just that male female dynamic was what made me. I think it was yeah. it was great. Like I yeah, I love that line too because I do feel like it just really nails it home for some people. Like some people really either at that point or just I mean they're over with the character, you know, they they're full in the hate of her kind of thing. Um or they are going to enjoy the ride of it and be like, "Okay." <laughs> Well, I, I, I'd like to, to talk about some on that specific line. Um, when I was writing it, there was there's I'm a big fan of True Detective and there is um, the second season. Rachel McAdams character has something similar to that. And she asks the character, the Colin Farrell says that I think the principal dynamic between men and a woman is a man can kill a woman with his bare hands. And I, I enjoy writing clever women, intelligent women, female characters, because they have to outsmart the male. However they do that, they do that. Because individually, a man would most likely be able to like squeeze the life out of a woman. So the woman, how do I, how do I play this fight if I can't play it fair? What, what is fair in my book? How do, I, how do I do that? How do I win this fight without brute strength? And that line was directly associated with how that would happen in my mind. If you got someone to fall in love with you, then you're more easily, then they are more, more easily manipulated to situations where they may be more aware of. Like, for instance, the character that Jessica kills, um, he hears something. He kind of knows something's not right. But because you're with someone who you, who you think loves you, like, it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. You believe that. But the truth of it is that was never the case. So there is a little, there is a, di- a dynamic in the writing that kind of, you know, leads a false sense of security um, between the characters, which, yeah, that was completely intentional. Yeah. Yeah. It, I thought it was also very interesting where we see uh, as with the with the description of the film as you go on watching it, we, we see Madison in this role of the protagonist and we're going to follow her through. And if this were like kind of that more traditional, I guess, slasher pick, she's probably the one that would walk out triumphant from I faced and I had the strength to kill the, killer the final or girl. Kinda, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That kind of thing. And um, maybe if anybody did. Right. But it's like <laughs> so. So that gets turned on. And said, I feel mm-hmm. like you made you had um uh, good use of kind of playing with the role of protagonist a little bit too, because all of a sudden our, 
uh, you know, you've got her and then, then Audrey takes a real front stage. And then of course you've got the people who they are hunting and then the, whoever's hunting them. And I, I felt like a little bit, you're like, Oh, that's a little bit, uh, is there a main protagonist or is there not? Which is often more interesting, but, uh, so I just felt like, yeah, that was uh cool how you kind of played with who, who is who in this, who are we supposed to be following yeah. plot wise and who are we supposed to root for? Yeah. And I mean, we, you know, I think Madison, especially, you know, she, she is, that's exactly it. It's kind of the setup for it. Um, I, for me, at least coming out of it, I always still was like, you know, as an audience member, like, man, yeah, it's, how do you feel about her? You know what I mean? She does go through with this killing, but at the same time, she's still pretty conflicted and you know what I mean? And we still feel for her. It feels like because she kind of has to do this. She's um, not as into it as, right. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's, um, so we definitely were like, you know, it's always interesting to have uh, characters that aren't just black and white. You know what I mean? It's not just they're on this weird line of like, do we, you know, are they okay? Is it justified? Is it not? You know, um, that's so fun to play with. And that was very much, we talked about that with, with her. We were like, we it's going to be like her story and her sister's story. And then it is going to switch. And we're going to be like, oh, are we rooting for the guys now? You know what I mean? Are we following the two guys at the end and trying to root for them? Or do you still feel conflicted when things happen to the girls? You know what I mean? Like it, we really, I, I love that dynamic in it. Um, that was great on Chris's part. And the idea of having values and morals, but what you do if you care for someone, like how firm are you? Are you like, like the two sisters, are they, they're obviously willing to kill for each other. Um, you know what I mean? So they, uh, no matter what, they're with each other. But but I think what we want to do is kind of put the audience in the shoes of, would you do that for your sibling? You know, and where, where, where do you stand on that? Because I think the values were were very fluid in this case, except for that part of it. So, you know, and, and, and I do think that at some point, the love for the sisters, I, even, though, even though you know they're bad, I think the Madison being kind of the one that is likely to kind of, I mean, if she lived, she may have just ran away. She may be like, I don't want any part of this. You guys handle it because there is another sister. Um, but I, I do think that there's something to be mined out of that where people would be like, yeah, I kind of get where Audrey f- is coming from. And again, again, it's, we want people to identify with our characters. We really want that. We want to have a conversation piece about that part of it. Well, it's it's an interesting question, of course, to always ask ourselves if there's something that's your family tradition that you carried. I've, if you're taught something from a young age, you probably tend to believe it's true. I think most of us, if anybody who's gone through any kind of a philosophical or political or religious change in their life of any kind, of any major philosophical pivot, you know how difficult it is, right? Or and you know what uh, or how how much it interferes with the relationships that you have with your family and things. Now, for most of us, that doesn't involve kind of murder cult, uh, <laughs> annual murder cult behavior. But um, but you know what? We want to hear from you. Call us if uh, – no. <laughs> Phone lines are lining up. But, that will be an interesting interview. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, but, but this takes it kind of to that – there is that to where I don't get an idea – I don't – there's a line there, of course, where Audrey identifies, like, I like that. I'm good at this. I like this. I'm excelling at this, which, you know, if you're going to do something. But uh, but you think of that like you would if it's like, well, this is actually kind of almost like a religious belief that we have to do this. And you get Madison who's like, yeah, I'm, I really am sorry, but we have to. And Audrey who's like, mm-hmm. hey, we have to, and I don't expect you to get it, but I'm good at this, and, and I'm doing it for my sisters, and... You know, I yeah. believe that that's it. They, I didn't get I any idea that, that they that they wavered in their belief that we have to kill people every year. That's a that's a tradition. We have to do it, um, mm-hmm. which, which makes them yeah. more interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, the, that's the, the, the I'm a huge fan of lore, and um, especially talking about mining out of what came out with Samhain and an old an old Halloween and whatnot, and um, the fact that they were saddled with this curse and just like uh, in her monologue, she says, there is no reason why they were picked. Their family was picked and that's the end of it. They were touched by a demon that says, you have to, you have to offer something every year or your entire lineage gets wiped out. Like that's the end of it. And so uh, they have to, and some of them, the older sisters have just accepted it. 
we'll trade off. I do it one year, you do it the next year. It's a lot of stress. You build, you know, because there is like a strategy to it. So, and then the youngest sister who tried it and then failed miserably almost to the point of dying, it just kind of resets that. I mean, the, the you know, the harvest has to go on. You you have to offer something. So whether, you know what I mean? So, so, so there is that part of it. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, I mean, murder cult, it's got, it's got to happen. It's got to happen or it's, and your whole family's lives depend on it. Like, like Jessica says, her sister's lives depend on it. Um, it's a big deal. It has to happen. So in the lore of this story, um, it's always one of those ones again, where you're watching and you're being like, Oh, maybe they're right. Are they right? Is this a, is there a fantastical reality in which they are? And I don't know that that's answered in the film, but I'm always curious about the lore that doesn't make it on screen. But movies are, and stories are always more interesting when there's more lore that didn't make it into the story. I think I'm not a huge fan of over explaining everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I liked that. I, I like when I watch something and I feel like, Oh, I bet you know the answers to some of those things, but we don't <laughs> have to, everybody can think about it. Right. So I don't know. Is that a fair question? Question, are they right? Is there a real? It, is that why they all got killed? Because she screwed it up last year? I think it's it is a fair question to ask, um, and I think we do leave it ambiguous. You know, we we definitely have talked about it, and I think for my part, as prepping as an actor, it is real. It's very real. You know what I mean? Um, but I think it is ambiguous. I think there is a bit of like, okay, so what? You know, um, do we believe this? Do we not? Because we talked about it a lot. I kept being like what are the consequences if this doesn't happen? You know what I mean? Like, again, to make it a little more real for acting and things like that, and, and especially directing, then we have to get our other actors there as well. Um, and yeah, it's like, what could we come up with that is like the most terrible? And how did this come about? How do we pass down the traditions? Like, there's so much to it that we have discussed and worked out. Um, but that, you know, you can make a prequel out of it, basically, if you want it. But then that's the whole point, right? Is that it's it's much more fun when your imagination can fill it in. Or if you do have a lingering question, um, where it doesn't feel like a plot hole or something, but it's at least lingering. And you're like, I wonder if, you know, I think that's that's way more fun. I mean, I, I kind of feel the same way. Like I, I believe <laughs> it's real. I, when I was writing it, like this is this is the truth. But it's true. There is no I mean, we could do like a spin-off and cause I think in my mind, the lore it, whatever touched this family has also touched other families. Like I'm a I'm I like to play with the idea that evil just kind of is in the ether and it just happens to go into something and, and whether that's a person, a lineage, whatever. But in my mind, I definitely thought that it was real. We couldn't show that. We um, uh, Madison does mention it in her monologue when they're looking at the giant skeleton. And she says that uh, pain, uh, death, suffering, all those things happen. Well, it's it's just said and alluded to. It's never actually proven. You know what I mean? We'd have to have like another family or whatnot uh, to kind of do that. But no. Well, if you're in, if you're in it, I mean, if, if my family's been cursed with this, it's kind of a... It's kind of a hardcore test if you're going to say, let's test these beliefs and just not kill anyone this Halloween, and then we're all going to die. I mean, that's the only way. Yeah, know, right? yeah. But I, we all have lived. We killed someone every Halloween, and we're still alive. I guess that proves it, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, kind I of a confirmation bias. Totally. Yeah. I, I had it in my head for the whole time that it's like they talk about their mother has passed on, and I had that in my head the whole time that I'm like, something happened one year, and their mother passed during this time. And to me, it's like that's enough for that at least test, Audrey. Okay. Yeah. To me, yeah. I'm like to, for Audrey. Audrey, that's like her proof, her enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that was my thinking behind it. But mm. again, that's not necessarily in the movie. So <laughs> well, it's a great. I mean, that's one of the powers of the lore that you're mentioning. I think because just as you're saying that, I'm like, oh yeah. What if there are little pockets of other people out there? How would they handle this? There's a whole universe <laughs> right. out there. And once again, having more questions uh, when you're done, I think is is a sign of an exciting, interesting sort of story. Um. I, I noticed that in a lot of movies, I would say the majority of horror movies um, that have an interesting killer or killers or whatever, they're the ones we usually remember more, I think. And, and so that leads me to this idea, and it can be from your own projects or just what you think in general in horror. Who do we want to see when, do you think, usually, when we're watching? Do we want to see the the innocent, righteous person be able to survive and escape? Or do we usually want to see the scary stuff keep going? There's an implication. Because horror movies 
stereotypically many times end on a the end question mark, you know? Right. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a great question, right? Like, do you yeah. root for the, because, yeah, we do have some of our, I mean, I think that's the reason they end up having Friday the 13th and so many, so many going on and on Jason movies. You know, it's like, because at some point you start rooting for Jason. <laughs> right. Who's the protagonist? You know? Uh, you know, we all say Freddie, but what's the name of the girl who uh, kind of maybe yeah. sort of got away from him? Maybe, maybe yeah. except she didn't really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I, I think a big part of that, too, is that um, with uh, uh, elevated horror, I think that when we have motivated bad guys, um, there's a movie that came out this year earlier called The Violent Nature, and it's very uh, Friday 13th ish, but, you know, in a way, Jason was motivated. He was, he drowned because people weren't paying attention. You know, I think that when you have motivated killers, it's incredibly more interesting than if you just have uh, a mindless killer hunting people that are just kind of there. You know, that is a horror movie. Don't get me wrong. That's that we've kind of grew up on that. We love that. But um, I think the films that we're trying to make, we're trying to, it, just in, in our film, our killer in my opinion, is absolutely justified. Before you find out that it's, you know, the father of the kid that was murdered, like that was 100% thinking, how could we make our killer a good guy? And I think when you go in with that mindset, you can create something that's just a little different, a little more fresh, and it's not so traditional. Um, that, that to me is a huge deal. Uh, we want to kind of subvert the expectations. It's the same thing with the final girl, just like in this movie. I mean, if you've seen the trailer and if you've seen halfway through, you're thinking, okay, well, either Madison or Audrey are, is going to be the final girl, but we don't have a final girl. We have a final guy. So we, we're kind of, we, we don't, we don't want people to see this and be like, oh, I know where this is going. And har, har, har. it's like, we don't, we don't want that. Um, so yeah, I, just to answer your question, I, generally I like a motivated villain, even something as, uh, I mean, talk about Friday the 13th, again, Jason, and, and, and I mean, I don't know, I just, I don't know, that's so, much, that's so much more interesting to me at this point in my life, I would say, and I'm 45, I should say that, so. <laughs> that. <laughs> well, and that's a good example, I think, isn't uh, Jason one of those that they've they've layered more and more lore on over the years? He's yeah. the one that you hear more and more like storytelling about not any of the other normal people in the stories, you know, so that is interesting to, right. and I think it's in a way also, if we're looking at, if we're looking at stories eliciting fear. I mean, they always say, you know, the scariest, uh, the scariest bad guy is the one who thinks he's the hero. Right. Um, no, true. So yeah, the, somebody who has conviction and it's like, I truly believe whether I'm right or not, that this is saving my family. Well, what would we do for our family, right? If if we believed mm-hmm. that, so and that's even scarier in a way because it's like, ooh, what if I did believe that? Oh, could I? Ooh, uh, yeah. You know, then we're could then I we're actually... looking at our own existential fear. <laughs> totally. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's 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 a lot of fun and also fulfills all those things we were just saying about being scary and also having. Uh, that kind of that kind of uh, uh, feeling of the season, so to speak, as far as the fear of everything that people are <laughs> are looking for and getting into. Um, could you uh, tell people a little bit about where can they follow you and what? Uh, for, where do they find this? By the way, it's it's on demand. But what does that mean? Is it just uh, what platforms can they view this on? So um, you can get it on Apple TV, Amazon, Fandango, Vudu. Um, nightoftheharvest.com will take you to all where all the links will be. Um, I believe you'll be able to get it on Best Buy's website as a physical copy physical. and Walmart. Yeah, and Walmart's copy, uh, walmart.com as a physical copy as well. We got some uh, physical copies uh, out there floating around once uh, the 24th rolls out. So, yeah. Where's the best place for people to follow your, uh, your, it's Carter Inc. Films. Is that you guys? Yeah. 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 Um, Carter Inc. Films is our YouTube. That's our Instagram as well. We post all of our film stuff. Funny enough, we actually started principal photography on our newest film last Friday. And we've got stuff up on, uh, uh, on our, on our Instagram about that. And, um, any news about any upcoming stuff will be on there or be on our YouTube as well. Wonderful. Yeah. And that's Carter I N K films. Oh, Inc. Yes. in writing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, great. Um, anything else you guys want to want to put out there as far as anywhere else? Are those the is that the best central focal point? Is the the YouTube and the the website? 
Yeah, websites are kind of the, the where we'll you can get all the links for everything okay. else. Um, otherwise, yeah, Instagram's kind of our most active area, probably. Um, but yeah, I think CarteringFilms.com has one and uh, NightOfTheHarvest.com if you're specifically just for that. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm grateful to everybody out there for being here today to listen to us. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys um, my question. I like to give guests when they come on the show, and I'll. I'll I'll tell you what it is, and then I'll I'll plug our month's charity. We I like to highlight a lot of charities and nonprofits, and just kind of good practices to give back to the community. Um, and every month we we pick one to focus here on the show. So I'm going to share that with everybody. But then I wonder if you guys would be willing to share with people as well. It could be uh, just it could be anywhere anything. It could be an organization, or it could just be a good community give back practice. But our charity of focus this month is Mental Health Awareness Creative Arts Gallery um, in Hudson, New York, stigmafree.art. Many of you may have heard the episode where Brian Belt came on the show who organized this. It is an organization giving back to uh, the community of those with mental health diagnosis and struggling with addiction through art classes, art trainings, and also showcasing the works and giving a platform pe- for people to uh, engage in visual arts and and use that as a, as part of their own recovery from mental health and addiction related problems. Um, they're actually now working with the local drug court program as well, offering training and art to to help people through that as well. And if you go to stigmafree.art, like I said, you can uh, get involved and find out more about their their work. Um, do you guys have anything that's that's uh, near and dear for you that you'd like to share to people? I, I mean, do. we definitely, yeah, I was going to say, we got our dog from the Pasadena Human yeah. Society. Oh. <laughs> so we're always, uh, doggos are yeah. near and dear to us. He's definitely an emotional support animal to us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so we're big on the on the rescue because they tend to rescue us back. So, um, yeah, we, we really love them. I also will just say that it's, uh, ovarian, it's Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. So that's like a, a near and dear thing to me as well. And so there's a lot of good societies out there doing things for that um but yeah chris did you have any others well i was just going to say the past is inhumane society yeah. we, we rescued our dog from there and he's been fantastic and uh yeah yeah it's it's i think that for people coping with certain stresses and and not for everybody of course i don't want to classify it as that but i know for me um i, I had a lot of anxiety ticking for the first year in my job and uh, i actually have a note stating that you need to get something and so we ended up getting a dog the first year we were here um, and he's been fantastic and that I can speak on experience has helped me tremendously. Uh, just, you know, it, but I'm, of course I don't want to trivialize it, but yeah, PasadenaHumane.org is their website. Wonderful. Yeah. I love to look, uh, uh, highlight local and local areas too. And so it's good to tie that in, but yeah, just such a, such a wonderful thing to be able to, you're giving back obviously to, to the, the animals, but then also what they give back to. I liked how you said mm-hmm. that. Uh, so very wonderful. Thank you, uh, Jessica, Christopher. I'm, I'm really so grateful for you spending the time. And uh, thank you for making the film, for one thing, but also for, for taking the time to talk with me about it today. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. This was so fun. Yeah, Dwight, seriously, this has been awesome, man. Thank you so much. And funny fat, uh, fact, I was actually setting to be, I we visited your website a little bit before this, and um, uh, Abnormal Psychology was probably going to be my, my favorite subject in college. I actually oh. wanted to be a psychologist. Until I realized that I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna make six years of college. I barely made four, but uh, I, I, I enjoy uh, what you talk about a lot. In fact, when I have a DSM, I think it's I think a DSM three because of how old it is now. But when I first started creating characters, I really wanted to understand that part of it, and so I actually read my DSM um, when kind of crafting my. I don't want to say my evil characters, but giving them some type of motivation, like we were talking about, a lot of work goes into that. So I completely, uh, I really respect what you do and, and, and kind of the platform you give some people to, to be on. So we appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. And I'm, yeah. And, and anytime that I hear that it's, well, I'm grateful. Thank you for that. And also just for your own promotion of that of like psychological literacy and things just in everybody's pursuits i think that's really cool see that's a that's a good we got to get a dsm in everybody's office now no matter what yeah, we're, doing. I, we're yeah, all working absolutely. with people <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com. No one hates history, they just haven't found the right teacher yet. Or in this case, a nerdy best friend who loves to tell you all about world history, women's history, and weird history. Hi, I'm TK, the creator of For the Love of History podcast, a place for people who want to learn more but don't know where to start, and history lovers who want to break from the mainstream. From rat trials to warrior women, we cover topics from every country and era. Whether you're a history expert or just starting out, there's a place for you here in the time machine. So join me every Friday on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube for a brand new topic. See you there. Bye.